The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Parker. I'm an attorney with the firm of Marshall Parker and Weber, and we're here today to present Planning for the Pooch, an estate planning webinar all about pets, and uh, I'm going to be co-presenting today. We have more than one person in the room. I'm co-presenting with uh, two representatives of the Lycoming County SPCA, uh, Mindy Lyons and Vicki Stryker. So our goal over the next 30 minutes uh, is to give you an idea of a lot of the work that your local SPCA does to help our animals from serving as a shelter to investigating cruelty to animal charges and uh, their adoption services. Uh, I think we'll also talk a little bit about a fundraising event that they're having today, actually. Um, so in addition, I, as the attorney, am going to be talking uh, about some issues that you should think about when doing your estate planning as it relates to your pets, as our pets are often our kids in many cases. Uh, and these topics will include some letter of instructions, a power of attorney, uh, and your wills. So we're going to be following this PowerPoint, um, and I'm going to ask a few questions of my guests as we go along, and I encourage those of you who have tuned in to do the same. You have the option to present a question for any one of us as we're presenting the material. Uh, I should point out that I have an interest in this area as I am a dog owner. I think my staff actually put a picture on the slide presentation of myself and my basset hound, who I call Annabelle. Uh, and my uh, some of my coworkers are here today. Sweb, as I call her, Sarah Weber is here. She's our local tech expert who's going to be moving the slideshow along and dealing with the technology. So I'll mention her uh, as we're in passing. So let's move to that first slide, Sweb. We're going to introduce everybody. Go ahead. I'm Mindy. Mindy Lyon. I'm the development director for the SPCA. Yeah. And I'm Vicki Stryker. I'm the executive director. Okay, great. And I think we're going to start with Mindy. She's going to give an overview of the Lycoming County SPCA. So I think this is the slide we're starting on here, Mindy. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing at your organization? Sure. Um, Vicki's going to talk in just a minute about uh, pet trust, but I thought before we did that, we could talk a little bit about the SPCA. Um, as you can see on the slide there, we've been serving Lycoming County since 1892. We're a 501c3 and a privately run shelter. And what that means is basically we are funded by gifts from individuals and corporations. And just a couple of things that are unique about our shelter. We are the only one um, in Lycoming County that has the authority to investigate and prosecute animal cruelty cases. And we're also an open admission shelter. Can I ask you a question uh, as we go along here? Um, I saw on one some of your materials, you don't get money from the ASPCA. Is that, or do you? Um, we don't. We are sometimes eligible for some grants, yeah. but um, yeah, all of our funding comes from individuals and companies. And one of my roles is to let folks know that, you know, if their intentions are to make a donation to the SPCA, yeah. that um, to make that clear that it's the Lycoming County SPCA right. when they're working with their planners. So some folks might be calling or listening in from other areas, and, and they have their own SBCA. But most of the local SBCAs are run very similar. Um, it varies from community yeah. to community, yeah. but in Lycoming County, yeah. that's um, okay. how we happen to be structured. Okay, very good. And one of the things I saw in your material was that you only deal with domestic animals. That's right, and domestic animals encompasses a whole range of things yeah. from horses, snakes, cats, dogs, all kinds of yeah. uh Anything domestic, basically, we um, are obligated to protect. And I, I had a client recently who had a zonkey. That counts, I believe. <laughs> I think that does count as a domestic animal. Yeah. It's a little questionable, but I'm thinking it counts. <laughs> Go ahead, Sweb. Um, and just a couple of statistics. Um, I won't go through all of them, but basically um, we're a very busy shelter. Anyone who's been there can attest to that probably. But to sort of quantify that, we've had 3,173 animals that were handled uh, just last year. 
uh, over 1,200 that were adopted. We have a large volume of um, cases that our SPCA humane officer investigates. We have one full-time officer and two part-time officers and a number of cases that unfortunately have to go through the legal process in terms of hearings to prosecute. As so an attorney, I'm kind of curious about how this works. Um, so you have the authority to do investigations? We do. Yeah. And uh, we enforce the Crimes Code 5511, in Pennsylvania Crimes Code, and uh, it's strictly related to cruelty to animals. And our officer can present his case before the magistrate. Mm -hmm. And if it goes beyond the magistrate, the district attorney office will present that case. So this officer has the power to receive, I presume, a phone call. Like we have, you know, reports to the Area Agency on Aging for Elder Abuse. Mm -hmm. Is there like a 1-800 number that they call and say, okay, here, I believe there's abuse going on? It, it's, they call the shelter number, 570-322-4646. Okay. And we are only have authority in Lycoming County. So they would need to know the address of the place where there's an animal in need. And we investigate every call that we get. Mm -hmm. So we sometimes find that education corrects the situation. Mm -hmm. And other times we have to get a warrant and seize the animal for its protection. And uh, when we do serve a warrant, the uh, investigator does bring cruelty charges mm -hmm. in the courts. I see. So your investigator actually has the power to file the charges. Correct. Doesn't have to actually go to a police officer. You actually have that authority in the we, statute. We are sworn in police officers, and I am also one. Excellent. Because mm -hmm. uh, we do see the TV shows, and some people might be wondering, does this go on like you see on the animal? It's a little different from the TV, yeah. and it disappoints me a little bit because they don't show the process, legal processes yeah. that we have to go through. We can't take somebody's animal away from them. It's their property, mm -hmm. and we have to procure a warrant. Right. And so people get upset with us. Why don't you take that animal? But we do have to follow legal procedures. Right, right. That's, that's what I believe there was more to it. Than, mm -hmm. I mean, the yeah, shows are, are cutting out some of the reality. The DA does have to get involved eventually. Yeah. Yes. All right, thanks for that insight. Um, Anything else on this slide that we haven't talked about? What are checkbacks, uh, investigation checkbacks? Checkbacks, um, that pr usually refers to situations like Vicki referred to. Um, a lot of times these issues can be corrected with education, mm -hmm. and so our humane officers will go back to mm -hmm. see if, in fact, folks are following through with um, the requirements that mm -hmm. we yeah. put out there. Right. Understand. Great. Let's move on. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention that that's really exciting, and if uh, folks listening haven't been to the shelter in the last couple years, I would absolutely recommend mm -hmm. um, checking the shelter out. And it um, and if you'd like to call me, I'd be happy to give you a private tour. But we had a three room addition that was built and opened in 2013, and uh, it was three rooms and two part-time staff that were hired that are, are new. And we had two significant grants from uh, August Goldstein and Grace and Robert Barber, and their funds were matched by the First Community Foundation of uh, Pennsylvania. And just a really significant um, new, new uh, level of service that we're able to provide. For, for folks. So, so we're giving them a shout out at this time. Yes, thank you <laughs> to those people on the yeah. screen. It, yeah, it's really... Um, Do you see the, the growth in, in donations uh, is increasing as the years go on? I mean, I know it's always a struggle for nonprofits, but uh, do you see people generally concerned about the welfare of animals and regularly donating? Um, we do. Um, it, it's a challenge every year, though. And I mean, these folks are our heroes. And I mean, as we're expanding our services and facilities, it, you know, our cost um, to sustain those go up. And so, sure. you know, it's, um, you know, it sort of raises the bar a little bit. Okay. Let's see. 
Oh, the cats. The cat holding room. This is one of the three new um, yeah. rooms. And again, this isn't normally open to the public, but if anyone is interested in seeing any of these spaces, give me a call and I'd be happy to, to take you back and show you this. And, you know, I better keep moving because... Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's right. You got a few more. Yeah, and then our the next room that I uh, just want to show you, we have a spay neuter uh, surgery suite on site, and this is a, a picture of Dr. Lise Lund, our new veterinarian, and we're doing a number of spay neuters in house, which is new also. We also have a partnership with the Beckoning Cat Project that helps us keep up with um, primarily our cat spay neuters. And then the, the third thing I just wanted to mention, um, we have a new multi-purpose room that we do a lot of uh, different programming out of, but primarily our dog, um, dog enrichment programs. And this is just a, a couple of photos of our new dog behavior uh, behaviorist, Tracy Free, who's now on staff, and just a number of new programs that we're offering for our shelter dogs and also a number of programs that she offers for community members for their dogs as well. So the dogs have to run through this tunnel? Is that what I'm getting that, at? Yeah, that's actually a picture from our last pet expo at Indian Park, and that's one of the agility. Um, it's a, a small version of her agility setup that she has for our classes at the shelter. I don't know about you, Stacy. My dog would flunk that. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> Here we are reaching the Vicky presentation. She's got some points she wants to make about planning if you're not available to care for your pets. That is something that a lot of people don't think ahead about. And I know for myself, my daughters, they love me. They don't necessarily love my dog. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't specifically name somebody in my will to take care of those dogs, they may end up with them. And my poor dog probably won't be showered with love and affection as a friend of mine would shower my dog with love and affection. So that's always something to keep in mind, that maybe your relative's not the best person, and it is helpful to name somebody specifically for your pet. And that way you can rest assured that your pet is going to be well taken care of. Good. And then the other alternative, of course, is that the animal could be taken to an animal shelter. And I want to brag about our shelter. I think we do a great job. But it is stressful for the animal, especially if you have an animal that's lived with a, an elderly person in a nice, quiet environment. This, this shelter is stressful. It's full of noise, strange people, strange smells, strange animals. And so it's always good that if you, if you plan ahead for your pet, you, you will know where it's going. And... Um, if not, if that's not a possibility, we can help your pet find a home. Great. Yeah. Right. And one thing I didn't mention was that if you name somebody to take care of your pet and it doesn't end up at the shelter, sometimes nursing homes allow you to have pet visits, which is really nice. That is true. Um, we have a, 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 an employee, a Josephine, whose dog went through a training course to become a therapy dog, mm -hmm. and she is allowed to take that dog into the nursing facilities to visit the residents, mm -hmm. so that's part of her passion. So, um, and you were mentioning some information about naming caregivers, so I think this is where it transitions to uh, my area of expertise, that is putting these documents together that might help uh, provide instructions for pet care and also naming somebody to be the caregiver. Um, one of the things I recommend uh, from my clients is what's called a letter of instruction. Now, typically these are for people. Um, if I wanted to leave somebody a letter of instruction regarding my affairs, <clears throat> if I happen to be incapacitated, let's say in an accident and unable to manage my affairs, or maybe I was uh, deceased at the time, uh, um, you might want to have a letter setting forth basically all the stuff about you. Um, it might be about your financial accounts. I mean, where's your 401k information, uh, your bank accounts? Who are the people in your life that are your advisors? Maybe your financial advisor or your accountant or your attorney. And certainly, what are some of your wishes? Uh, burial wishes are a common thing to put in the letter of instruction. So you're sort of telling your kids who may know nothing about all of these things, hey, here's what you need to do. Here's my stuff. Here's where you go. Here's the people you call. That is what we typically refer to as a letter of instruction. Well, these have become very popular with regard to the care and control of the pet. 
If I actually go online and type in letter of instruction for pets, you'll see all these forms pop up. So people have come up with unique forms in terms of uh, presenting information about the animal so that their loved ones know what to do if they are unable to care for their pet. Um, so I want to leave information about my dog, Annabelle, such as the name of the vet, where does she normally go, um, medication, gosh, she gets older, she takes more meds than I do, so she, uh, she has uh, anti-inflams and eye drops and all sorts of things. Uh, allergies, habits, uh, eating habits in particular, preference for a guardian, as Vicki was mentioning, that might be a good place for it. Uh, preferred home for the pet. All these things you can put down in a letter of instruction. Uh, anything you can think of that I haven't mentioned? Things that... Food. Food. Yeah, that, uh, that's a big one. When you yeah. change a dog's food, it uh, generally upsets their system. So, so the brand, important. the brand mm -hmm. that you're Correct. using so you don't have digestive issues. And I know a coworker who has to have gluten-free or it's something, yeah, you, you're one of them, okay. Uh, so there are all sorts of unique things with pets, just like people. So that's where you might want to keep some of these instructions. However, a more legal document um, is the power of attorney. Um, this is used when you're incapacitated or unavailable to manage your affairs, and you're literally naming somebody to step in your shoes. So this person has the power to go to the bank and access your bank accounts, which is a big deal when, when caring for the pets. Who's going to pay for their care? So this document could be used, let's say, if you're in an accident, taken to the hospital. You can't make decisions about your pet's care. And somebody's actually going to step in your shoes and make decisions about where your pet's going to live and the care they're going to receive. I have to tell you, vows of attorney nowadays are getting really complicated. You know, you can get some form documents online, but Pennsylvania's form can be 10 to 15 pages long. Um, it has all sorts of things uh, dealing with cars and retirement accounts, life insurance policy, most of which um, deals with your personal assets. Uh, but they can also have a section about pets. It can say, hey, this person I'm naming in my power of attorney can take control of my animal, can decide where they're going to live, and perhaps most importantly, can expend my money on my pet. Just think if you're going to name a caregiver, maybe you know, this friend Vicky was talking about and the friend takes control of the pet, does the friend have the power to spend your money? Probably not. <laughs> uh, the power of attorney would. So maybe it's one and the same person or maybe your daughters are your power of attorney and your friend is the caregiver. It could be different people. Um, so all the costs that come up, trips to the vet, grooming, boarding, uh, and I seem to be going to the vet every other week for Lord knows what, uh, with regard to my dog, um, all these services have to be performed on your behalf. So you need somebody with the legal authority to use your money uh, to pay for these vet services. I suspect in a lot of cases, this is very informal. You know, the passing of a, a dog on to somebody is done very informally. Uh, you know, your sibling or child or friend comes along and takes control of the animal. Uh, but the paying a bill, when money gets involved, it can be a sticky situation. So you need to think that through. How are these bills going to be paid? Um, and I also thought it's really relevant when, when going to the vet and saying, I need some sort of procedure performed on the animal. The vet often wants consent to take this action. We're not just talking about a checkup or an ear infection. We're talking about perhaps a surgical procedure. And if you don't have the legal authority to make that call, uh, the vet could say, listen, uh, you know, I might not want to perform the procedure, go to another vet. I think the vets are very accommodating. You folks can chime in. But I, I do know that, that if I were a doctor, I would want some sort of document saying this person has the authority to okay the procedure. Especially if you're known to that, that dog or that cat is known to that veterinarian and there's somebody new here and, uh, that would, yeah. that would help things along. Definitely. Yeah. If somebody walked in with my dog and they'd say, Hey, that's Annabelle. Who are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? Where's Matt? So, and then we're going to just go on to the next slide. I think this is yours, Vicki. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to comment on this one, the financial well, plan. Well, one of the things that, to keep in mind is that your pet today maybe just needs routine veterinary care, but you mentioned as your dog gets older, she needs more care. And that is very typical with dogs as they age, just like people. And so keep that in mind when you set aside some money for the caregiver so that they have enough to give your dog the quality of life that you want it to have. And 
that way it won't be skimping on the necessary veterinary care. Yeah. And that sort of leads into my last slide here about how to handle this passing of your animal at, at your death. Um, you know, is there any formula that folks use? Because I have always told them, listen, figure out what you're expending on an average month and multiply that by 12, figure out the average life expectancy, add a little more, and you should be okay. I mean, and I would probably add some money yeah. for the caregiver themselves oh, so yeah, that yeah. they don't feel like their trip to the veterinarian is taking their gas, their time, mm -hmm. and they feel compensated as well. Good, good point. So I get asked about how to address these issues at death. Some clients want to address the passing of an animal in the will, or if they happen to have a revocable trust in the trust document. And as Vicki was mentioning, if you just have a general clause that says, I leave all my property at my death to my kids in equal shares, well, guess what? Your animal is legally property. It's a living, breathing animal, but it is property, much like your car. And in the legal sense, if you say personal property goes to the kids, so goes the animal. So if you want something different, you've got to spell that out in these documents. You've got to say, I leave the dog Annabelle to my sister Kate. And in addition, I leave her $5,000 for the care of the animal. That way, the specific instruction in the will will leave your animal to someone. And it was asked, uh, I think, in a question to me whether you can leave it to two people. Sure, I can leave it to Kate and her husband Dave, and those two people now own the animal. So, um, so if you want to spell it out, you can. Uh, we often get asked about pet trust. I think Vicki mentioned that in passing. That's a different arrangement. Uh, you can, with a pet trust, not only name a caregiver to care for the animal, but also name somebody to be the trustee who's going to manage the money for the care of the animal. That's a good point in yeah. case you have a caregiver who loves your pet, yeah. but also likes to gamble. Ah, very good. <laughs> so they might not be a good money manager. So you leave the money to somebody else and they spend the money on the and so it serves really two purposes. One, you can, you can control the money better and avoid issues of mismanagement. Uh, but you can also, at the end of the trust, name a charity. Um, so if the money's not all used at the end of the animal's life, the balance goes to the SBCA or the charities that you may choose. Um, and so that's often a goal of my clients. They want to leave something to the SPCA in their will, and this is a good way to do it. Um, leave the balance of the pet trust to a charitable organization. And I should point out, there's no inheritance or income tax to charitable entities, 501c3, so you can leave assets to them either now or at death. And, you know, if you're given a, like some stock uh, and you want to leave it to the SBCA and not have to pay those capital gains taxes, they'll cash it in for you and avoid having to pay any income tax. So it's not only inheritance, but lifetime taxes as well that you can avoid. So. Charitable organizations, good ways to avoid taxes. I think we are at, almost at the end here. Let's see. Uh, we're at the questions page. Um, what haven't we covered, ladies, that you think we ought to go over? We covered a lot about your organization, what it does for folks. Um, I've done a little bit of estate planning discussion, powers of attorney, wills, pet trusts. Anything, Mindy? Um, I would say uh, Vicki mentioned the phone number, but if you have any questions or yeah. would prefer to ask any of these questions offline, our phone number is 570-322-4646, or our website is lycomingspca.org. Yeah. Very good. And what's this Yappy Hour all about that you're having today? Well, Yappy Hour is a fun little social. Uh, we have it one Wednesday a month, and tonight weather permitting and we were just discussing oh what's going to happen we need to look again at that yeah. hourly forecast but um it looks like we will be at the sticky elbow from five to seven tonight with at least three maybe four dogs that are available for adoption and you just come down and it's a nice little meet and greet mm -hmm. for the dogs you can meet some of our volunteers and learn about um, our volunteer program mm -hmm. And it's just a nice. Yep. nice and the sticky night elbows, out. a local rest uh, restaurant slash. Uh, yeah, restaurant establishment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they have a beautiful outdoor patio yeah. that's pet friendly, yeah. and or at least pet friendly for tonight yeah. for us. And if you have your own dog friendly, yes. people friendly dog that 
it's up to date on its shots and all of that, um, they are welcome to join us tonight also. So that old sign that you usually see on establishments that say no dogs allowed, that's being taken down. Just for tonight, just I for think. Tonight. And just outdoors. <laughs> yeah. It's outdoors, that's right. They're on the patio. They don't get to go indoors. That's right. All right, so several of us will probably be enjoying uh, a beverage as yeah. well as meeting the dogs uh, this evening over at the Sticky Elbow. Um, and if you wanted to adopt an animal, aren't there just some very reasonable fees uh, for doing so? They don't charge an enormous amount of money for that. What do we got? It's interesting on who you ask that yeah. question. Yeah. But some people think our fees are high. Some think very reasonable. Yeah. And our expenses for caring for the animal, getting it spayed or neutered, its shots, its microchip, exceed the adoption fee. Mm. So it's $125 to adopt a dog. 40, 60 hours for a kitten and $50 for an adult cat. And of course that's all taxable. But we have over 200 cats available for adoption and we are overflowing and needing homes. And I will offer anybody out there who tells us they listen to this webinar, they can adopt two kittens for the price of one, and any adult cat they can get for half price. Wow. And you just say, Vicki said so. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want to tell one of our co-workers, uh, Shelby, that. Show me she, her desk. She, uh, <laughs> she walks in there all the time, comes out with a cat. She's one of those ladies. So uh, uh, we, we may, may or may not mention that to her. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to wrap up a little early today, but I want to thank all of you for chiming in. Uh, we've got just an announcement here about our next webinar. Stacy wanted me to tell you this. Next webinar, Business Succession Planning with Attorney Tammy Weber and Liz White on September 16th from the same time, 1 to 1.30. And then following that, a special webinar event about Senior Crime Prevention with Agent Janine Holter from the PA Attorney General's Office. Very impressive. September 23rd from 1 to 2 o'clock. That's an hour-long presentation. So, uh, yes, abuse of the elderly, a big topic nowadays. So hopefully you can pass the word on and if folks are interested in that, tune in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.